I told my wife about, you know, I'm having a call with this mastering engineer and he's really into dynamics. I'm sort of like more on the loudness side. And um, I know that, you know, some people who follow his channel have commented on mine saying, you know, negative 14, negative four, which isn't a resemblance of you, but it's just a, sent a, a an audience sentiment. And I know on your channel, you'd have the opposite of people going, yep, yeah, that's not the way it is. You know, in the industry, you know, you got to, you got to make it louder. And she, she said something really interesting. She goes, um, you know, is this guy a respectful guy? You know, is, is he a nice, you know, like, you know, some people online can be a bit brash and well, I go, no, 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 no. I've, I've, I've heard him speak and, you know, I'm listening to his podcast, you know, he's, he's, he's really tame, really good. And he goes, that, that's really good because she goes, if your audiences, if, if there, if there's a subset of your audiences that are, that are very combative in conversation, it'd be very healthy for them to see two people, a different uh, other sides of the aisle discussing things in an amicable way. And I thought, you know, that that's a really good point. Funny question, because this is something I don't think has ever been asked to a mastering engineer. How do you explain your job to your kids? <laughs> um, they, they, I think they understand it. They, I think they kind of, you know, I'm, I'm like, okay, so you know you've got, you've got a band and they're in the studio and they record the thing. I do the bit afterwards where we make it sound really cool and get it on CD or upload it to streaming. And, and I think they have it. And then suddenly they'll come in and say, uh, you know, oh, hey, do, did you, I don't know, add the such and such to, to this recording? I'm like, no, that's not what I do. <laughs> <laughs> but it's the exact yeah, there's, same there's a level experience. of understanding, but it's, it's not quite there yet. Yeah, that's the exact same experience. There was um, baby John on and my daughter's watching the TV two years old and she goes, oh, that's daddy. And one of the characters is playing guitar. And I'm like, yeah, not quite. But I, I think that's something we could like mutually uh, like have experience because it's just such a such a weird thing to explain our jobs to people outside the industry. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's it's in the bright ballpark, right? It's it's music. It's kind of, you know, that's 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 pretty close. Yeah, I, I've just I've just simplified it down to, I just rock up to the studio each day and listen to music, and then I go home. Like that's that's the scope of my job. Like, I, if you get into the technical, it's really weird. That's definitely a conversation I've had with mine, where it's it's like, but you just sit there and listen to music, right? That's easy. I'm like, yeah, there's other stuff. <laughs> yeah, it's that whole there's conversation about half of a career is the stuff you don't enjoy, at least half. Oh um, man. Oh, that's awesome. I, I'm I'm so happy to have connected on that. That's something I've never asked another mastering engineer, and um, I think it's a a reality. That I mean, it's not just our kids, with. right? It's everybody. It's like you know, that 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 whole thing. You know, you're a, a, you know, you go out for for drinks or whatever, and it's like, oh, what do you do? I'm a mastering engineer. Oh, <laughs> and they're gone. It's like, yeah. <laughs> Even then, when, when you try and explain it, it's like, how do you dumb, not dumb it down, but like make it concise into a single sentence that people who are outside of our craft can understand? It's really it's, hard. Yeah, it's it's that bit where I say it's it's like it's the bit after the band are in the studio where we just try and make it sound as good as it possibly can. Most people kind of get. I don't think they really understand what's involved, but they they kind of have a, a semblance of understanding at that point. Um, and then they're like, okay, so who are the really famous people you've worked with? And you're like, oh, okay. It's not really about that. But do you get and and do you get stuck on that? Because for me, it's like when I look back at my credits or I put my portfolio together, there's records I really love and there's records that I'm really proud of and ones that have done very well. But then, you know, our bodies of work are in the thousands. So when we're hit with that question, it's like, where do you start? And like my brain just chokes up. I'm just like well, I mean, yeah. so, so the, the funny thing for me is that very often some of the most, there's a ton of quite famous people I've worked with. Like, for example, uh, the guys out of King Crimson, who most people mm. have never heard of, right? You talk to musicians and they go, oh, yeah, yeah. you know, Robert Fripp, Tony Levin. Oh, cool. Um, you know, um, and but most regular people, you know, if it's not in the charts right now. Um, and I think the thing that I struggle with is that actually most of the stuff I'm really proud of is not necessarily the big names. You know, it's it's literally people nobody's ever heard of that are my favorite projects or that where I feel I really had a a major, major impact. So um yeah, I usually just deflect and I go, no, nobody you've heard of. It's a weird it, one. It kind of bugs me that, that there's so much um emphasis placed on those names, you know, because you know, I've I've got some big names in my back catalogue, if you like, but they're not about what define me 
as being a great mastering engineer. You know, just because they're big names doesn't mean necessarily that we have that much creative input or that what we bring, you know, I mean, in some ways, the bigger the name, probably the bigger the production, probably the bigger the expectations, the number of people, the more restrictions you have. You know, the most freedom I tend to have when I'm working is when it's with, when I'm working directly with the artists. You know, they're the people who really care about the music and they're completely open to whatever is going to sound the best and work the best, you know. Um, and that's the most satisfying stuff and where I tend to have the most input. You know, if you've got something for some major rec- I don't do much work for the majors these days, but, you know, even back when I did, it's the the kind of, you know, putting you in a box just kind of increases exponentially as far as I'm concerned. It's like, okay, it has to be this, it has to be this, it has to be this, you can't change that, this, this mixer, it's, you know. Um, so, yeah, I it is this kind of weird paradox where there's, yeah, the stuff literally that I'm most proud of, most people have never heard of the people I'm working with. Yeah, and how put it's it's really interesting there's there's a story um which goes right back to your roots and that's the metallica album the mastering engineer writing back to the fan about not being too proud of them i ended up looking up the credits before this course so i know the name of the engineer but i'm not going to call it out i'm um, out of respect but it's just it's it's just an interesting paradox and i actually had this there was a record that went out 2 weeks ago i'm not going to say names but it it's it's done very well and um, I'm not happy with my mastering on it. And it's so disappointing. And it just kicks me in the bum. That's that's a real shame. I mean, is, is that because of just your contribution to it? Or is it something about the project that meant you couldn't achieve the, the best that you might otherwise have been able to do? Or um, it was, it was, <laughs> so, so this is where it gets fun. It was, uh, People that are a party to the project auditioning or on, the only their only audition mechanism were one of those tube boxes speaker things, and they just wanted more bass. So uh, revisions were made, circled around that, um, which is like okay, I want to make everyone happy. And then uh, this this was a big label one, so it's sort of like where 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 can you push and where can't you push? And then it was one of those circumstances where I was like, okay, we're in the thick of it together we need to get this over the line for everybody. So everybody else is happy. And then in hindsight, I've sort of looked at it and I've gone, still sounds good. Like to the average listener, nobody's going to kick my ass over it, but we take a certain sense of pride to find those, not just the 1% that we do f- that makes it that much better, but like the 10th of a percent, which we do behind the scenes, which make it incredible um, exponentially over time as, as we improve our skills. So that was just a, a kick in the, a kick in the bum to me. Yeah, that's that's a real shame, and it it kind of makes me think. I mean, something that happens much more often to me is when we know that the source isn't the best that it could be. Like somebody sends me a digital transfer of something that I know that came from analog tape, and it's a it's a record company, so I know they've got the, the tapes in the archive somewhere. And it's like if we could get a clean transfer of that with modern converters, all these kind of things, you know. Um, and basically, the person at the record company just doesn't want to isn't interested you know it's like no that's the source that's what we've got go with it and it's the same as you right it's it's the relationship and the the client interaction that becomes more important at that point you know it's like i don't want to kind of cause problems for this client i don't want to mess up my relationship with this client so i'm going to go along with something that i know is not really the best decision um but that's the way that it is yeah that stuff really you know it's it's one thing to kind of have technical challenges and get it to a certain point and wish we could go further, but that's just the way that it is. That's also frustrating, but at least that's kind of, that's because of what the project is, right? So you kind of accept that. But yeah, when it's for kind of almost like political reasons, that's almost even more frustrating. So that's a shame. Yeah. Oh, well, it happens. It it, it will happen again, no doubt. And then how we manage that is really important. Um, that's a conversation I I am happily now more than previously um developed better relationships with ARs and managers where they respect my opinion um which is great and that's that's awesome because uh and I think the fact they respect my opinion is I'll, I'll give you an example and then I'll ask and, and and this this will tie a little bit back into how you sort of mandate your mastering sessions because I know that you know you're not somebody to drive for loudness super hard but um so 
over time, a uh, in my scene, that was sort of like electronic pop sort of scene, um, there was this real push for using certain mastering engineers. But then as the independent artists I work with started getting signed to these labels and these managements and whatnot, they wanted me, but they go, look, we don't have the budget for Nick. We're going to use X, Y, Z, blah, blah, blah. But then enough artists get on these labels pushing for me. They actually want me on. So they go, oh, we'll try him. And then they realize that the artists are happy. And then so on. So that, that transpires really well. Um, and that's in a, and that that's really hard because at the start, if you if you wanted anything to go over well, it is like you're pushing crazy loudness, like that is wild loudness. Because the ANRs will just look at it and they'll be like, "What's this negative twelve luffs on a dance record? Like, really? Is that a demo?" And then they'll just throw it back. Um, but over time, I've managed to garner respect there. They're still loud records. They're not they're not super dynamic, but there's more room to mitigate there. For yourself, how has have those discussions went on an industry level? Like engineer to engineer, we all agree that, you know, we don't want to be crushing and making it distorted. But in terms of the way you liaise with um ARs and managers and people who are sort of set in their ways, but are uh sort of the conduit for making that project from start to end, how how's your interactions been? It's a real mix, honestly. Um, and I, th- I think in some ways I've been lucky, right? Because I've been independent now for, uh, almost 15 years. So I basically worked for, uh, one of the UK's leading independent mastering facilities for 15 years. That was, I was trained there and that's, that's where I kind of cut my teeth. Um, and then I set up on my own. Um, so back then there was a ton of label work and and stuff where we were dealing with A&Rs rather than artists. Um, but luckily there wasn't a huge push. There was, it was almost more like the conversation then was how much should we try and make this stuff sound like, because there's quite a lot of um, remastering and um, reissuing. Um, so it was, it was a question of how modern should you make this recording from the seventies or eighties, right? You know, how much should we try and bring it in? And and we would have an opinion that was our taste. And sometimes the clients would want to go even further. Um, so it wasn't necessarily about extreme loudness. It was just kind of, you know, really big, really bright, really um, compressed, I guess. Um, so that was more of the conversation, but on the whole, they worked with us because m- most of them had a range of different engineers who they went to. Um, and and they would choose people for the projects based on on skill set and past experiences. Um, so, and and then kind of the the two coincided. You mentioned mentioned the, the death magnetic thing. That was me blogging about that was the thing that kind of got me my first sort of hit of of attention on the internet. Until then, I was a complete unknown. But because I happened to, you know, for anybody who hasn't kind of picked up on the story, you, you mentioned it was really unusual because the mastering engineer was asked a question by a fan, which he answered, he thought in confidence, and then the fan shared it on the Metallica forum and all hell broke loose. Um, but you also had this weird situation of the the audio also being available as part of a game on the PlayStation. Yep, Guitar, Guitar Hero. Hero game. So suddenly people could compare for the first time, which was really unusual. So... It's like it's something that we've been talking about in the industry for years, but suddenly there were examples that you could play to people, and uh, and there was there was a story behind it. I mean, it's a fa- you know it's a great story, one of the loudest yeah, things in the world. Really Everybody's story. complaining yeah. about them being too loud. Um, so that whole thing went went viral in a kind of a small way, um, and that got me people interested. And that was a couple of years before I went independent. So basically, at that point, I started getting a name as somebody who was. I'm not going to say anti-loudness because that's not the case at all, but, you know, just kind of talking about this stuff and saying, look, loudness it for its own sake is not necessarily a useful goal and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And because people were really interested in that, I talked about it more. And that's how I've ended up with this kind of, I remember saying to one of my colleagues at the time, you know, I don't want to be the the anti-loudness guy. And, you know, here we are 10 or 15 years later and it's like, okay, well, that didn't work out. Um, but I guess on the positive side, it means that most people who come to me are not expecting that. In fact, they're probably coming to me mm. because they want an alternative perspective. You know, it's because they want something different. So I think all of that has helped. That means that the conversations have been really successful for the most part. And and I always have the conversation early 
in the in the relationship to make sure that I know what their goals are and if I think I'm going to be a good fit. Um, and I think the one thing I want to say that kind of ties back to what we were talking about before is that one of the things I find most sad, really, looking at the situation now is how many major name engineers there are who have just been beaten down, who've who've stopped trying to because my my experience is you try and have these difficult conversations sometimes it goes well sometimes it doesn't if it doesn't you end up doing what the client wants that's that's the job um but when it goes well and they can hear the benefits of a more dynamic master or having a mix that was less crushed in the first place and then we push it to the same place but we do it in a different way all of that kind of stuff then you've got a fan for life, right? Then you've got a client who's going to come to you because you achieved this amazing result and because of your opinions and your... So that's a huge win for me. And it makes the difficult conversations worthwhile. But I see so many people out there, and it's probably because they just work more with majors and they're dealing more with A&Rs than with artists, perhaps. You know, they've just had the experience so often of either losing a gig or, um, you know, somebody just not being happy and going, well, it's not as loud as that. And that they kind of, it's not an option. You know, I just have to do this. Otherwise, you know, they, they, yeah. I'm not going to say they've given up, but they've just, they're so dispirited about the conversation, you know, that they don't feel they have a choice. Um, yeah. And that's, I just think that's really sad. I think, it, you know, because the, the reality is these days with most people listening online and with normalization, so the loud stuff gets turned down, we do have the freedom. You know, I, I'm, if people want to master loud, then they should. If that's what's best for the music, then that's absolutely what they should do, right? But what I see more is so many people feeling that they they don't have that option, that they have to do X, Y. It has to be minus 10 or minus 8 or whatever it is. Otherwise, it's not going to compete. People are not going to like it. All of these reasons that are given. And I'm not convinced. You know, I just think that's a shame because it it it's stifling their creativity. You know, it, it makes them feel like they can't do what they might otherwise have done for for all these different reasons that don't really stand up. Mm. I, I also think the overall loudness, like in addition to that, the overall loudness of a track, if you just look at the number, you can't hear the music. So if I wrote down a uh, WAV file, negative eight luffs, and you never heard it, you wouldn't know if it's just a white noise or if it's a number on there. Um, and the reason why I say that is because you're talking about the discussions you might have with an a &R. They heard the demo or whatnot that might be louder, this or the other. So much um, happens upstream that affects that final master which people don't consider like the sound design like the, the the way it's performed the consistency of the vocal how much compression had to go on the vocal because they were moving in and away from the microphone or the bass player you know you know really when it got to a fast run just lost a lot of energy and it was just you know it was really slack sort of playing um that all affects the sound quality, which the mixing engineer gets and how far they have to push it and compress it and whatnot to actually get it sounding tight. And that, that that's, and the, re the reason why I'm saying this, and this is actually really funny. I just did a, a STEM master today and I, the reference master, you, you would have loved this was, was negative five and a half luffs. Okay. That was the reference master I got and it didn't sound good at all. It sounded actually really horrible. And the thing that made it sound horrible wasn't the fact it was negative five and a half fluffs, at least in my opinion, because lucky I had the stems, the kick drum had this, and you might've seen it in files you've seen before with samples, had this huge sub uh, opening up on the tail. So it had the initial hit and then the sub opening up. And that was chewing up all the headroom on the limiter, making the limiter duck after the initial transient. So you've got an initial squash and then another squash and then another squash. So all I had to do was wave shape that kick drum. And then I could hit the same loudness and it was just a small sound design feature and it felt clean. It was still stupid loud. That That's, you know, that sort of style called on it. But people don't look to those things. They only look to the number. They'll only go, oh, can you make it a decibel louder? Like you've probably experience that I've experienced. I think every mastering engineer's experience where they send a master back and they're like, oh, can we have it one decibel louder or one and a half decibels louder? And it's not a case of turning the limiter up. It's actually a case of looking at the material and assessing, you know, what's, you know, what's that path forward? Yeah, it's, it's absolutely true. There's, there's so many different, I mean, the, so the two things that makes me think of the first is this problem with overall numbers, 
you know so when you say there's a file at minus five lufs that could mean two things right it could mean the overall the the integrated measurement for the entire file is minus five in which case it's probably pushing two or three db louder than that at the loudest moments right so it's getting up to minus three or minus two which is crazy loud or you could mean that the loudest moments are at minus five in which case probably the average is maybe minus seven um and that's still pretty damn loud but it's it's not minus two and minus three right so there's a single number can't tell us the whole story that's that's one major thing um and then the other thing is is yeah what's happening musically to create those numbers right so if something so for me I would say I don't go louder than minus 10 short term. I actually do, okay. um, you know, minus nine here and there, whatever. But if the question is, how do you get there? If it's minus 10 all the way through, that's a song that's loud all the way through. And then it's a question of how much does it go above that average level, if you like, right? Whereas you could also get a reading of minus 10 for something that is actually way lower most of the time. And then the loudest bits get up to minus eight, minus seven, minus six right because it's it's not actually an average but it's kind of an average um so yeah the the and the question is how do those internal dynamics work right what is the contrast something i see a lot is files where in order to achieve the overall loudness level the loudest sections are just crazy hot and then the quieter stuff is down below overall it kind of looks right if you like but the result is that the super loud bits are really really crushed and it it's it's hurting them, whereas the rest of it sounds pretty good, you know. So there's, yeah, there's there's so many. Well, and that brings me into the second point, which is the numbers also don't tell us what it sounds like. Which is like, you know, it could be music, it could be white noise. Um, just because something measures minus six doesn't necessarily mean it sounds loud. If you took if you recorded a flute, right, which is a really soft, gentle acoustic instrument with hardly any transients i guess if somebody was really you know that kind of breathy style perhaps you might get some transients in there but if it's playing as kind of sweet sustained melody it's so easy to just turn that right up right because the difference between the peak and the loudness is small so you can just crank it up you don't have to use any limiter or anything else you can get that insanely loud but it's still a quiet instrument and even when we hear it even if it measures loud our ears go well that's a flute it's a quiet thing right whereas by the same token you could have a black metal band just thrashing full tilt, you know, and full of distortion and all the rest of it. Even when it's been normalized, our ears, we hear, listen to it and we go, well, that's a loud sound, you know, or an explosion or a gunshot, whatever, whatever these things are. There's, there's, there's the psychoacoustics of it, right? There's our interpretation of it. And in terms of music that translates back to, yeah, how much distortion was used, how much compression, how much parallel compression, how much saturation, what was the stereo image like, um, you know, what is the what are the internal dynamics, the contrast between the loud and the quiet sections? Um, you know, even back to things like the arrangements, you know, how were the drums recorded? You know, is it a super tight kind of dead 70s drum acoustic drum sound, or is it kind of thrashy, I don't know, John Bonham, you know, huge reverb? All of these things kind of go towards what we think of as loud, and they're completely independent of the numbers. I mean, they're not completely independent because if you push the LUFS hard enough with any gear, it's going to distort. And some of that distortion will give you an impression of loudness. So, you know, but if in the kind of more what I consider conservative ranges, um, you can get something that sounds super loud without it measuring a super high LUFS. Um, and you can have something with a super high LUFS that doesn't necessarily sound sound that loud. Um, so yeah, there's there's so much that goes into it. And I think the the way the place that people get caught out is because of this whole thing online of, of louder stuff being turned down. That's the reality of how most people hear things. So I think as well as all the other decisions you made at every other stage, it's super important, right? When you get to the end to listen to it in that way with the loudness matched, you know, so everybody, this whole thing about minus 14 LUFS, you know, it's not a target. It's not a goal. You don't have to master at minus 14 LUFS. That's just where most of the streaming services will turn stuff down to. But what is important is what does your song sound like when turned down to minus 14 LUFS versus your reference track when it's turned down to minus 14 LUFS, you know? So it's it's, it's the contrast and the the balance between those that is super important. Um, and I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about that, which 
understandably, you know, it's it's complicated stuff. It's pretty technical. People get frustrated because they just get results that make no sense to them. And they, you know, they end up going, oh, forget it. I'll just, you know, smash it. <laughs> um, yeah. Or, or not make it loud enough and then, you know, end up still unhappy because actually it doesn't work out the way they hoped either way. It's, there's a lot to unpack. Yeah, there, there is a lot to unpack. And I think I'm regretting not asking this question before because I actually wrote it down. And instead of giving my own antidotes, I wish I'd asked this question because I think it was a good question to ask. Um, so you said num LUF is, or measurements aren't a useful goal, as in to, to guide your decision making in mastering, to go, oh, I'm going to enter this master and uh, because it's uh, this style, I'm going to do this LUFS number. Or because it's for streaming, I'm going to do negative 14 and that's it. But then you also said when you're starting a project with a client, you go to uh, align or discover what their goals are, you know, like. That, that's a really important part. Um, what questions do you ask or what goals are you trying to define with them when you are like, you know, I'm, I'm curious because i got my questions and I'll let you know what they are later, but I want to know what yours are. So I usually, I, I, I would just say to them, um, well, very often the first thing I do is just get them to send me the the material, you know, somebody contacts me and says, oh, you know, would you be interested in mastering this for me? And I say, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, please send me some examples so I can take a listen. And quite often you can, you know, a big part of being a mastering engineer is just intuition. It's just instinctively understanding what the client is trying to go for and help them get closer to that, you know, to have empathy for for, for their goals and their musical objectives. So you, you can often figure out a lot just from what they send you. Um, if it's a super loud mix already, then that makes me realize I have to ask the question. Um, but if I, if I hear it and I think, well, I'm, and I'm not, I think this could go either way, then I will usually um, say to them, you know, what, what do you guys, do you have any reference tracks? Do you have anything, how, what would you like this to kind of work with online? For example, you know, if, if you, what kind of stuff do you imagine coming up in a, this coming up in a playlist with? Um, and if they send me a reference that is then, typically mastered super loud that's when i'll say okay just to make you aware this has been mastered super super loud and that's not something i i really enjoy personally um if that's something that's important to you as part of the mastering process then you know you might want to consider working with somebody else who's who's going to enjoy it more um basically um that's the way of kicking the conversation off and you know they will either come back and say oh yeah no we really want it to sound like that and then i have to make a decision whether i think i can achieve that for them music with, with a result that I'm musically happy with. Um, very often they come back and say, no, you know, we don't really care. You know, so, so long as it's going to work well um, and, and stand up against, you know, the competition, then, then we're happy. Um, so at that point, I'll then do them an example of what I would do. Um, and we kind of take it from there. Um, and, and that's another thing you didn't ask this, but it, it, again, thinking of our earlier conversation, a question I have is whether the clients really want the stuff as loud as we think they do. <laughs> um, yeah. By which I mean, like I say, there's so many people who've had bad experiences in the past that they just kind of, okay, I'm just going to do this because that's what people want. Um, but the other thing is, so I, I mean, this is not a scientific thing at all, but I asked in the Pensados Place Facebook group, it's a, a bunch of mm. musicians, engineers, you know, uh, enthusiastic people about audio there and i just said how many of you disable normalization in spotify because okay. you can go into the settings and you can say turn this off i just want to hear the files with the original lens and and something like three quarters 75 percent of people who answered said that they did right so regardless of whether that's an accurate number or not that's that's kind of most of them that's the majority whereas i've been told that of spotify users only 17 percent of people actually go in and change those settings at all um and yeah. there are ones where they can make it quieter as well as louder um but most people go with the default settings so what that tells me is that the way that most people listen to this music and the way that a lot of us the people who care most about the music are thinking about it and listening to it are completely different right yeah so it kind of sets up this if you disable normalization you go in and discover that your favorite band is four db is louder than your current master that's going to feel like a problem but i'm not sure that yeah. i'm not even sure whether those people you know engineers and musicians they probably re-enable that 
as soon as they stop listening to kind of figure out how loud people are because it's so annoying to have all the levels jump around. Um, but that's a kind of tangent. Maybe, uh, well, the only other uh, thing uh, I was going to say was yeah, that the, yeah. um, when I, kind of going back to your other question, when I ask people how loud do they want things and they come back and they say, even when I say, actually, I think I'm I'm not going to really enjoy, you know, I've, I've tried it, right? I've, it, I just find it frustrating. You make it louder. It doesn't sound quite as good. So I back it off. That sounds better, but it's not loud enough. So you make it louder and you just go around in circles and it's just yeah. not enjoyable. Very often when I say that to them, they say, well, you know, just do us an example of what you think is what you would do so that we can hear it. Um, and I'd say three quarters of the time, they're happy with that. You know, they're like, yeah, that sounds great. That's 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 plenty loud enough. Um, because at the end of the day, the kind of levels that I'm talking about and the kind of levels that you're talking about, we're only two or three dB apart. Now, it doesn't sound like a lot. When you're right up at the maximum there, it makes a huge difference to what you can achieve and how easy it is to achieve and what the, the final uh, result can be. But two to three dBs, I mean, there's research that shows that people don't even clock that. You know, they like Sound on Sound magazine did a did a thing where they just played people a bunch of, and they didn't normalize them or anything else. They just, some of it was louder and some of it was quieter. Had no influence on people's preferences or taste for the, and you, the same when you look at the charts, you know, there's no, it's not like all hits are super loud. I mean, these days they tend to be because most stuff is so loud, but over time, there's this massive range. And so, yeah, I, I don't know, but my, my my thinking is probably that more people would be happy with more balanced dynamics than we tend to assume. You know, there's this kind of the the meme, if you like, now is well, it just has to be loud, right? It has to be minus eight or minus six or whatever it is, and that's just kind of taken as red. And I'm not 100 percent convinced yeah. that that's true. Yeah. A lot to unpack there. A lot to unpack. I'll, I'll unpack it, and then if 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 you've got any commentary, I'd, I'd definitely invite it the fir mm. the first thing to unpack which which you mentioned 17 percent of users i i i have a gut feeling because i know i left my spotify account on idle paying a subscription for two two years after i got it that i never touched the setting and i know a lot of people would have free accounts where that could potentially skew it one way or the other but that that's more just a side note um on data and, and using um Reference tracks was interesting because you said something, uh, what, what they can achieve musically and mastering and whatnot. And then you're talking about loudness and when you push it a bit loud, then you have to dial it back when you A, B, and then it's sort of this, this back and forth game. And I got an alternative to all, all of that. And this is what I think. And the reason why, uh, you as an experienced mastering engineer has a, have a really good success rate. At when you do your own thing, people enjoying it. And I think it ties back around to what you said when you listen to the mix, it's your own intuition about where it should go. You've listened to 2,000, 3,000 mixes. So you can listen to it and go, oh, well, maybe I do need a little bit of compression here because there's some ghost notes in the snare drum which are, are getting a little bit lost. Okay, fair enough. Okay, cool. So you compress and you do what's tasteful for the music. With that said, there are people who are mastering their own tracks who don't have that intuition to understand the production quality of the mixes itself. So they're hitting, you know, negative 12, negative 13 luffs. And even if it was driven to negative eight luffs and it was, and when it is level matched actually to commercial tracks, it doesn't feel as good. So they feel the need to have to push it in order to compete. So my thing going circling, circling around to that in terms of unpacking what you said is I think. You like we could even de-emphasize loudness as a discussion there, and just focus on the intuition and and the, and the creative aspect of it. Because I think there's 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 more value in anyone who's following discussions around mastering or loudness or whatnot to understand that it's the creative decisions which have the greatest impact and results, not necessarily the loudness decisions. So I just sort of wanted to unpack that. Because there was a lot for me to digest, which you put out there. Yep, absolutely. Um, no, I was aware as I was talking that I was just kind of it was point after point. Um, so I'll answer the. You probably might have to remind me what your points were. I'll answer the last one first. Um, it, it makes me. I completely agree. Right. The so loudness is a key decision, right? Because 
because of the, the the equal loudness curve, the Fletcher Munson curve, you know, if you if you turn something down, we perceive that it has less bass and treble. So to me, there's no point in EQing something until you've decided what the level's going to be, because if you EQ it when it's quieter and then you turn it up, the way you feel about that EQ will change. And it's you're just making more work for yourself, right? So for me, stage mm-hmm. one of every master is, okay, let's decide how loud this song is going to be. Not even overall, just kind of relative to everything else, right? Here's the loudest song in the project. Here's the quietest. If this one is here, then this one needs to be here. And, you know, you I, I don't actually do it. I could do a pass through the entire album first, just setting the levels um, and then start working individually on songs. I tend not to, but that would that would work, right? That would make sense to me. So loudness is important and fundamental in, in that sense, but relative loudness. Um, after okay. that, yeah. it all comes down to taste. Um, and And you're absolutely right. And all my decisions are made for musical reasons. It's... Um, People kind of criticize me for saying I talk too much about numbers in terms of loudness and, and all the rest of it, um, and that I'm suggesting people go for targets and um, that I'm trying to game the, the normalization system and all the rest of it. It couldn't be further from the truth. The exact opposite is true. So it's kind of ironic because I've made loudness penalty plugin and the dynameter plugin in particular that are to help people get their head around how all this stuff works. Um, but I don't actually use them in the sense of it's not like I'm looking at it like you say I'm not going oh that's the number that I need to go for what I do is I say here's a song here's the loudest section here's my EQ that I'm going to get that sounds good to me in the loudest section okay now I go back and listen to the rest of it huh that's the verse now that I I think maybe if I just automated that up slightly that would be a better balance between the verse and the chorus because it's kind of losing a little bit of energy in the verse after that big chorus right and People might say, well, you're second guessing the mix. But often what I find is actually I'm not. It's just how does the chorus sound with the compression and limiting that I've chosen to get the right control that I want in that loud section? And that changes, that's then different from the mix, right? And that changes the relationship of the verse and the chorus. So you just need to update the overall level to to and you do all of this work and you end up with something that sounds almost identical to the mix. It's just more controlled, more balanced, and probably louder. Um, so I'm doing all of that for musical reasons. And you're absolutely right. For if, if there's ghost notes and that I might bring in a little bit of, um, parallel compression, or I might just lift out the, the upper, you know, the four to six K maybe just to get a little bit more of the snare sound or whatever it is, or I might tweak the stereo width just to get those guitars that are hard panned to, to chug a bit more, whatever it is. I'm doing all this stuff for musical reasons. Then when it gets to the end out of interest, I'll look at the number for, oh, what was the overall loudness? What was the, you know, what does Dynameter show? Um, am I happy with the results? And I mean, I'm going to say nine times out of 10, but more than nine times out of 10, almost all the time, I'm completely happy with the results, right? Because what I have learned to do, what I was trained to do <laughs> 30 years ago now, um, to, to get the best results for the music actually translates perfectly for streaming and for vinyl and for everything else, right? Because the musical decisions, you know, the, the reason we, the reason st- streaming services have chosen minus 14 is it's a kind of reasonable compromise between the super loud stuff that's being done today and the more dynamic stuff that was done back in the 70s and 80s. And they need a platform where that's going to sound, people can play whatever they like and it's going to sound right. Um, they didn't choose that number for their theoretical reasons. They chose it because it enables them to achieve that balance so that and so the point is the numbers grow out of the music, right? I'm not. Mm. People ask. It's really hard when you're starting out and you don't know how any of this stuff works. You know, the, 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 nothing annoys me more than just make it sound good. You know, or use your ears. It's like that is correct. That is true. That's what I do. Is I use my ears to make it sound good. But I was trained, and I had a. I've got a wealth of experience to help me get. To, if you're starting out trying to get a good result with this stuff. The, the possibilities are, are endless, you know? So having some rules of thumb, having some guidelines, oh, well, maybe something a bit like this, kind of, you know, like this, just helps people get started. But the numbers that I'm suggesting to help those guys come out of what I know sounds good from listening to all the music from over my career. Um, so absolutely, musical decisions all the way. Um, and And at that point, you know, 
certainly up to the kind of minus 10 LUFS level. I'm not convinced that the loudness makes a huge amount of a difference. I mean, it, it is true that when you try to achieve a certain loudness, it will encourage you to use a certain amount of compression and limiting. And that is the kind of thing that people have used to achieve the kind of sound you, you're going for over the years, you know? So if you aim too low, you maybe won't be encouraged to make those things and you might end up with something that is too dynamic for the genre that you're going for or for the, to, to fit in with the reference tracks, all that kind of stuff. Again, it's musical factors. It's not really about the numbers. Um, so, yeah, did I answer all the things you unpacked or was there anything else? No, I think I think that was a good sort of like movement around um, our responsibilities as mastering engineers, but also you, you unpack something really, really good, which was uh, when people starting out, where do they start out? You know, like as in, you know, what is, what is that guide through? And it had me asking a question to myself and I, and, and it was a mastering engineer is placed on a pedestal. You think about it, you know, you got the recording engineer, they go, oh, the mixing engineer will fix that. The mixing engineer does it. Ah, oh, the mastering engineer will fix it. And it's, and, and and we speak of um like we have very good virtues as mastering engineers in terms of you know we don't want to do any harm we we want to do what's in the best interest of the project especially because we're as third party as it comes to the project we're not playing the music we're not there recording it physically we're not producing it driving performances out of people we're very uh third party so we're objective in what we do um so we have a very musical mind and approach but I think it gets put on a, and I'm gonna I'm gonna be uh, assertive with this. I think it gets put too high on a pedestal, mastering as a in 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 a general scope to fix problems or things that come before it, and that's where people starting out get stuck. And I'm just I'm just curious what what because how do I put it? You know what sounds good. That's your job. You know, like, you know what sounds good. In your opinion, you know what sounds good. So you also know what sounds bad. So coming from a mix, a mix coming through to you, and like you said here, uh, you listen to the reference tracks, um, what can be achieved musically. Let's throw out musically and think about technically and objectively what does not work when a mix comes across your desk. What are, you know, your top few things that you hear commonly that you go, this will, cannot work separate to the musicality side. So one example that I that springs to mind is when somebody sent me a song where the vocals were all panned hard left. Okay. Yep. <laughs> that, that's that's perfect. That's like you know, literally Yeah, I mean it's I, I mean if you were going for a vintage 60s you know early stereo thing where you'd have yeah. the drums on the left and the vocals on the right maybe but that wasn't what this was this was a sort of I don't know middle of the road rock song and and you know that was just you know, I had to say, I'm really sorry. I think you need to, you need, there's some stuff you need to look at in the mix before mastering is going to be valuable for you. Um, yeah. And I put it as nicely as I could and I never heard a reply. So I obviously pissed him off. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm, it's interesting because there are different approaches to mastering. This isn't what you asked, but you know, th there are lots of mastering engineers out there who the first thing to do when the clients send them the thing is go, no, that's not good enough and send it straight back. You need to fix this, 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 this. And their clients love them for it those tend not to be the kind of clients that I get. <laughs> um, so I'm very cautious about that kind of my, I always try and be respectful of what has been sent to me and assume that it is exactly what the client wants. So just because I think, oh, I don't know, it's got no bass or it's horribly distorted or it's completely mono or whatever, you know, kind of things that are not to my taste. Um, I and, Unless there's something kind of, wildly wrong with it like if something is i don't know digitally clipped by 6 db in a genre that mm. just doesn't seem to you know where i th there's a kind of a threshold where you think i don't think that's creative decision i think that's a technical mistake you know because yeah something is something has happened accidentally and i just need to i just need yeah. to say i noticed this could is that how it's meant to be you know it might be and if so that's cool but but then kind of below that threshold of well i think it's a technical fault um I will just kind of go, okay, that's, and then I'll just do what I think makes it sound better. And I'll, I will do a master and I'll send it back and I'll say, Here, here's how I'm hearing this. I think, you know, this is, these are my goals. I wanted to get more depth with whatever it is out of the, the sound. Um, and if I have an intuition, like, so the really common one is just something that's really 
heavily compressed in the mix. Because this is, I mean, oh, another yeah, thing we haven't talked inside, about, but yeah. something that's happening a lot these days is that the mix is already coming to the mastering engineer so hot. There's that's not something you can fix, right? You you either have to go with it, or you have to uh, talk to them about what might happen. So my approach is: this is sounding really cool. I think it sounds great. I can't help but be curious whether I could get an even better result if it had slightly less mix gus compression or the maximizer or whatever limiting or whatever it is um if that's something you'd be interested in hearing then i'd be very happy to do that experiment um but if you're really happy with how this sounds that's absolutely fine too um and i get a really good reaction to that kind of conversation i can pretty much say every time that the client has kind of indulged me with the experiment i've been able to get a result that we're both happier with and it could, it could be just as loud as the original mix. It's just having more flexibility at the mastering stage tends to be helpful. Um, but I mean, other things that, I don't know, so every so often you'll get something where the piano, people want a wide piano sound, right? So they flip the polarity of one channel of the piano. Mm-hmm. So yeah. it just leaps out here. And when you hit the mono button, it disappears. Or there's a dodgy cable somewhere and, you know, something in the mix disappears when you yep. put it in mono. Um I would ask a question about that. If it was completely in mono, I would ask a question about that. Um, those are the kinds of of things. It's, it, it's yeah, it's this thing about having intuition. Does this feel like a creative decision to me or does it feel like maybe something that if they were aware of it, because you don't know what people are listening on either, you know? Um, I watched a YouTube video the other day where somebody was um, reviewing the BandLab auto mastering service thing. And I was going, this okay. is quite an interesting, he's given me quite a good summary. And then I realized that he was listening on his iPad speakers, <laughs> which absolutely you want stuff to sound good on an iPad, right? But, you know, it's, you can't hear everything listening on earbuds. You know, you for me, you listen on the a full range mastering setup and you optimize it for both that full range setup and the earbuds. Um, and if you only listen on one, then you there's stuff you're going to miss. You know, there's just... Um, you won't hear proper bass if the speakers are too small, all that kind of stuff. So yeah, it's a real balancing act. And it's it's a real, you know, the, that whole client relationship, that's such a huge part of the the project. You know, I mean, the one of the things that always astonishes me is when people send uh, send me stuff, they say, oh, I had this mastered by one of the biggest name mastering houses in the world. And I'm not really happy with it. What do you think? And I always, the first thing I say is, well, have you, have you mentioned that to them? Have you? I'm sure they would want to know, and I'm sure they'd be happy to try and get you to be happier with it. Um, and, you know, often I find, no, they don't want to talk to me, or that I can't talk to the engineer, which I find astonishing. Um, I guess that's an online mastering situation. You know, or they say, no, he says this is how it has to sound. and Or just they, I could get the sense that they just don't feel able to go back to that person and ask the question, um, which is such a shame, mm. you know, because it could just be a conversation. Um, and and they'd end up being completely happy. So, yeah, I wandered way off your your topic there, but <laughs> no, that's that's perfectly fine. Um, it's really interesting you talk about the approach when a mix comes in, because for me, I know why people work with me for like they they hear my folly. They know they know in terms of especially for electronic music or pop music that I'm pushing overall levels. When a mix comes in, and I hear it and I know they're going under the assumption, you know, they want to push it loud. I do see it through that lens as in that's what I'm listening for. I'm going, okay, if they want to hit above negative 10 luffs in, let's say long-term integrated, if that's what their goal is, where's the bass? Where's the vocal? How harsh is the vocal? Where's the snare sitting? Has the snare already been clipped? Like I'm listening to those things way that, that happen way downstream and if like like I just yeah, yesterday did a whole bunch of EDM like banging EDM stuff, I already knew that that through that lens the tail in in the sub was extending a way you know like when you you look at a waveform and then it just like like shoots up into the air and I'm like yep it sounds great as a mix but for their direction if I put this under a limiter or a clipper it's going to sound disgusting. So it's sort of like, that's where a discussion is like, look, if we're, if we're pushing for this, this reference that you sent me, might have to revisit this in the mix. If you're pushing for this reference, we might be able to achieve it. Um, 
So for me, it's like a whole QC process where I do, I am one of those engineers that go through and go, okay, uh, the three questions I ask is what do you like about this mix? What don't you like about this mix? And what are your references? And if they tell me something they don't like is the low end, then I'm like hypercritical of that early on because it's really hard to fix things up there in my, like, there's so much you can do, but everything you do comes at some cost. Um, and I try and avoid all the compromises as possible because, uh, when things are pushed, that's when things get exposed. Like as in you've, you've heard loud masters, which maybe could have sound good loud, but you know, there was some artifacts or distortion in the background that were maybe very soft, but then when it was driven, they're just so obvious. It's like, well, that's no good. It's, it's, it's really interesting. I mean, I, listening to that, I feel lucky that that's, it's not a challenge that I have that often, you know, um, because I'm, I am able to just, I don't really, I do worry about loudness. Like I say, it's one of the first things you think about how loud are all these things going to be relative to each other? How loud is the loudest song going to be? Um, but because I'm not typically shooting for minus eight or above, you know, which I think is the kind of integrated loudness minus eight and above is where for me, I have this uh, analogy. I got a graphic made of it once called the, the loudness cliff, right? So it's like push, getting the loudness of a song is like pushing a boulder up a, up, a, up a hill, right? And you, at the bottom, you kind of, you don't get much improvement. Then you get to the middle and you're in the steep section and you can get quite a big improvement in sound and loudness by pushing it up. And then it starts to level off at the top and you can't get any higher and you're just pushing up against, you know, you're in the physical constraints of how much clipping and limiting can happen in a signal. And if you go too far, you push it off the other end and it smashes on the rocks on the other side. Um, so, I mean, it's just a silly analogy, but for me, I'm... The, the stuff that I'm doing, the things that my clients are happy with, it's rare that I have to push something so hard that I'm concerned about exactly how many dBs of limiting I'm doing, you know, because I tend to use a balance of compression and limiting. Um, I use the compression to control the body of the sound, the tone, you know, and limiting to control the transients because that's what the two things are good at. If I want more aggression, I can use a little bit of soft clipping to share the load with the limiter. It's, but basically I can just, set the levels and go right now what are the musical decisions and and it's and it and it becomes musical decisions of okay is the verse uh, is the relationship between the verse and the chorus right rather than can i squeeze another db out of you know xyz um yeah. so and that's yeah that's just a really nice position to be in because and and, and that's kind of what i would like other people to feel able to do as well you know, because yeah, there should be the freedom to make that decision. So I didn't exactly. mean to interrupt. There should be the freedom to make that choice. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I feel like so many people feel that's not an option for them. Um, so that's why I constantly, you know, talk about this stuff. And uh, you know, people are so bored with hearing me talk about it at this point um, because it, it, it. There's been so many times when I just go, you know, what? I'm just, I'm going to forget about it. Let them do what they want to do, and it's fine. And then an album that I love musically and an artist I really care about brings out and I listen to it. And I go, this sounds amazing, but if only it could. And okay. Another tangent. People say to me, you don't know. You can't listen to that and say it could have sounded better if it was more dynamic. How do you know? That's what the artist wanted. That's you don't have the mix to compare with. And they're right. That's absolutely true. I have all I can go on is my experience in the instances where because every so often somebody will do a stems competition, right? Where a mix competition, where a famous song is put up on a site and that gives the people yeah. opportunities to rebuild the original mix, but without the original mastering. Whenever I get the opportunity to do those comparisons or you hear a well-done Atmos master, which will be maximum minus 18 LUFS compared to the yep. stereo version, um, you know, or you hear an early master versus a late remaster where the loudest has been pushed harder, all the time, there's just stuff that I prefer about the one with more balanced dynamics. You know, it's just got a little bit of extra space, depth, clarity, all that stuff. Mm. Um, so, yeah, uh, you know, I can't know for certain. It's just my experience is, I, I believe there's a sweet spot. You know, I'm, when I'm mastering, I'm like everybody else. I'm making stuff louder all the time, and I'm using dynamics processing and all the rest of it to achieve that. Um, but 
yeah, you bring it up to a rough, somewhere around here and then you push it higher and it just, it just gets harder and it stops being as musically satisfying. You know, you, the, everything is cost benefit exercise, right? It's, it's, you're, you're right. You can't do anything without some kind of side effect. And the question is how musical, how satisfying, how pleasing is that sound effect, the side effect? Um, and yeah, once you get past a certain point, which in my opinion is around minus 10, but in Bob Katz's opinion is minus 14 or minus 16. And I don't know for you, maybe it's minus eight, maybe it's minus six, you know, everybody has different opinions. I just, yeah, I want people to feel like they have the choice. So the, f- the first thing I identify is like in terms of, um, a final number in, in my own process, uh, I don't look at the numbers until even after I've authored the final production master and got everything exported, it's more just a curiosity thing. Like I don't look cause I just I'm like, yeah, cool. That's a later thing. Um, but something that's interesting for me is the puzzle. I'll give you, I'll give you a story, um, that happened early on in my career. I'm talking 10 years ago. Um, there's another mastering engineer who I looked up to. Um, I sent them a master I'd just, just done fresh out of this studio. So I'm like, oh, this is really cool. I'd love to get your feedback. They send it back. They go, and and I think, I think they quoted Bob Katz off this on there. Like, it's not how loud you make it. It's how you make it loud. Um, and I'm like, cool, good. That's great feedback. Cause I was one of those people struggling with just slapping a limiter on and getting confused. So that, that's what like pushed me down the rabbit hole in the puzzle of, oh, okay. So how does the mix have to come in? How does it have to sound? Um, and I'll actually touch on something you spoke about vinyl on in one of your podcasts, but how, how does the mix have to sound to be a good quality mix? Cause a good quality mix is, is, is primo, but that's usually, uh, foreshadows being able how or gives you a limit, uh, loudness potential. Like it sort of foreshadows how loud far you can push something. So it's like, what, what are the qualities of good mix? Then in mastering, really learning to master, quote unquote, master my tools in terms of understanding exactly how clippers work, um, how the algorithmically clippers work in terms of understanding that, um, you know, a, a lot of what we use digitally, are things like arc tangent curves and the way, the way you can actually manipulate those filters and those, that wave shaping and to what effect, and then how you can analyze a waveform and, and manipulate in that sense. So you can get away with a lot more with very little um, not very little, but a uh, negligible distortion after the fact, and then push things. Because as you're saying, um, you know, pushing your limiter too hard, I've done masters where I'm at long-term integrated negative eight and a half, but my limiter is only doing one and a half dB of limiting, like very little. And, and it sounds great. And I think it circles back to, I'm not sure if it was on the 20,000 Hertz podcast or the one you did with the Australian in Sydney. Um, but you spoke about mastering so it would sound good on vinyl. And I I think, have you checked out Simulate by by Fabian? Oh, yeah. 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 I use it for for mastering for, for when I have to prepare masters for cutting engineers um, to audition everything. And it's exceptionally telling of how good of a job you've done in mastering because you can see how much excursion would be on the needle, you know, what what's the width of your groove, how consistent is it across the album. Um, and I think that was a, like for vinyl that, you know, QC or, or actually like pulling putting together a vinyl master, it goes through a very similar process to what I'm thinking of when it goes to putting together a loud master, um, maybe not technically identical, but the same thought process of I need to fulfill X, Y, Z in order to get this output. Same thing for vinyl. The vinyl thing is is super interesting because I mean, I've I, hands up, I've never done any actual vinyl cutting, um, but over the years, um, a, a good number of my masters have been sent to Abbey Road, Heathman's, um, Porky's, different places to have vinyl cut, and. I've always had great feedback from, from those, you know, very often they'll say, oh yeah, no, we, we just cut it flat. Um, so again, the, the decisions that I'm making because of the training that I had and for, because of my musical sensibilities translate really well to vinyl. And that kind of makes sense because I grew up listening to vinyl. So to some extent, my tastes were formed by what was achievable on vinyl back in the late eighties, early nineties. Um, so that's one thing. Um, Simulate was fascinating. The thing that astonished me about Simulate, so this is a slightly long story, but I think it's worth it. Um, I mastered an album for 
um, an, an artist called a band called Artemis, ten or twelve years ago now, um, mm. that I loved, loved musically, loved that it. it was so satisfying. The I've uh, forgot this is a terrible. Oh, David Earl is it? SF Logic Ninja. I didn't realize at the time that he had mixed it. He's sort of reasonably well known in the YouTube scene. Um, anyway, he I need to check that name. Um, loved the sound of this album, um, and I did what I consider to be a conservative master of it. So I don't know what the actual figures were, but it would have been in that loudest moments at minus 10 kind of thing. So by modern standards, um, very much balanced dynamics rather than pushing for loudness. Um, and I used it at the time to make a YouTube video because people were obsessed with the, the TT meter back then. And there, there's a there's a database where you can go and you can look at all these numbers. And oh, yeah, compare, yeah. They were comparing vinyl with digital. And I used this as an example to show that you can't do that because um, – the band had this cut to vinyl and they sent me a rip and I loaded them up and it looks like the vinyl is way more dynamic because it's much spikier waveforms. You have to have it a lower level or it'll clip. And it's like, but I know that that vinyl was cut from the 24 bit files that I supplied, including the limiter because the limiter was making a worthwhile contribu contribution to the, the sonic decisions that I made. So I made this. So of course, when Simulade came out, I thought that's the perfect example to to test all this stuff, right? So I pulled that master back out of the vault and ran it through Simulate. And the thing that astounded me was that there were fairly long side lengths, I've got to say. It was 24 minutes each side, which Jeez. is is challenging anyway. Mm. Um, but I had to reduce the level from memory of my master by 6 dB just to get it to fit, right? Yeah. Um, and I think I even did a test where I reduced the side length so it was 20 and 20. And there was still a massive gain reduction from my conservative master, right? So that was that was the first time I'd realized even all of these. So if if like whoever it was who had to cut Death Magnetic, where a lot of those songs are minus three, they're going to have turned it down by ten or twelve dB just to just to fit the thing onto the vinyl in the first place, right? So from my perspective, that's just a ton of wasted headroom. <laughs> Um, yeah, and and these days when I supply masters for vinyl, unless the the limiter is making a really significant contribution to the way that the song sounds, I will actually remove the final limiter. So you've got my master in at whatever yeah. it is minus ten, minus eleven, and then it's six dB lower to allow three or four dBs of peak headroom at the loudest moments, because I just know that's going to enable the vinyl cutting engineer to get an even better result. Um, and yeah, it, you know, in this everybody's still singing the praises of the sound of vinyl and stuff, and it's just. There weren't any masters that loud back then because you physically can't do it on the format. It's not about the needle skipping or anything else. It's just you can't fit it in the grooves. Um, yeah. No. So, yeah, you know, again, it's a question of sweet spot. It's like the masters that I'm doing don't need to be so dynamic that they could be cut to vinyl because they're going to CD and we can have really transparent limiting that enables us to get a, a better, more satisfying result. So there's no point in going that far, but there's also no point in going three or four dB louder from my perspective because you're just you know, fighting against the laws of physics in a way. Um, and it's, it's, it, there's no question it's an interesting challenge. Um, and I agree with you. It's really cool and important to understand how the tools work. Um, yeah. But just for example, one of my favorite clippers is the one that's so, so all the time that I, well, not all the time, the last five to eight years I was working at SRT, which is the mastering company that I worked at before I went freelance, they had the TC Electronic System 6000. The hardware oh, yeah. Yeah, no. processing box, yeah. touchscreen faders, amazing converters, beautiful piece of kit. You can now get the plug-in for three hundred pounds, <laughs> um, which is astonishing. I always liked the soft clipper that was in there. It, it, you didn't have a ton of control. You basically just dialed in the ceiling. Um, but the thing that I liked it is you could set it, for example, to start clipping at plus two, right? So you could have your chain coming in, and you could just round off those those high and you'd they'd still then have to hit the limiter and get a couple of dbs of limiting but balancing those two was always something i enjoyed in terms of kind of you know the a little bit of extra distortion and a little bit of extra impact is sometimes what you want and sometimes not what you want so to have the independent control of those i have no idea what how it relates to any of the stuff like standard clip or any of the things around these days but i still like the sound of it in that plugin um they just implemented it really well whatever the decision was um and I don't feel I need to understand the nitty gritty of that. It's like when I first tested standard clip, it was like, well, how close can I get it to sound like the TC? Um, and the answer was 
fairly close, not too bad. Uh, you know, I'm not actually that convinced. At the end of the day, clipping is distortion. It's like if you if you minimize the aliasing and um, you know you set the thresholds right, then it, it's it's just it's all about how it sounds. You know, it's yes, it's kind of interesting to know that oh, I'm doing 3db more at this point or whatever. But at the end of the day, if it if it sounds good, I'm happy. Um, yeah. And yeah, thankfully because I'm not often having to push super super loud the kind of the real nitty-gritty of it doesn't have to kind of be on my radar in the same way um yeah that's a fun puzzle it's it's but it's a fun puzzle for anything when you get a new tool like i'm sure um you've encountered it because you've been putting together your plugins with meter plugs where you you, you sort of have like it, it's a bit separate to the whole um like processing mastering process but it's like oh i've got this problem uh i know on the website you can throw it throw the file in um and then it stays local so that way when people want to compare they can compare spotify youtube this that the other that's a problem in itself so you, you've created a solution to it for me i look at the tools and i go well not how can i hack these tools but like how can i uh use them in different ways to, to manipulate it so i can do things that you wouldn't conventionally do but can make it make, make things sound really unique and cool um especially in mastering because nothing is worse and we can unanimously say nothing is worse than just something that's been flat hard clipped flat limited it's squash the hell out of and you don't know why so that's that's why i like exploring these tools and going weird ways like even a, a, a different ways um there's if you've got those uh, isotone isotope ozone 11 um in the exciter module if you set that to the sustain portion you can just saturate the body and leave all the transients natural and it's a really unique and weird way to for different styles of music to flesh out the sound like um today i had something with with a bass in it and it just felt like the bass player was just it was sustained but it was tailing off a bit and falling a little bit behind in the mix and i'm like oh i like where the kick drum is and i don't really want to throw eqs on down there and whatnot so i just used the sustain portion and excited a little bit just to make it a bit more clearer just weird quirk that that to me is the puzzle and greatness of like um what I what I navigate daily in mastering. So I don't look at it as like a burden to have to like be going into something to make something loud. It's like a puzzle. And you try and get that puzzle correct 99.9% .9 of the time, but you know, you do your best. Yeah. It's I mean, I I completely I, I, like I say, you definitely do need to know how stuff works. And the the fun of it is, I mean, the the tools like you're talking about in Ozone are kind of like a sea change, right? In the last three or four years. The whole, you know, um, oh, I've forgotten the name of it. The, the, there's various ones that allow you to deal with the transients separate to the to the body of the tone, like you're talking about. You know, the, the yeah, yeah. mixing things, you know, loudness, um, mastering, rebalance, all that stuff is kind of like science yeah. fiction stuff. It's things that we would only have dreamed of using ten years ago. So that's a whole dimension itself. But even something like um, I've been trying the Michelangelo EQ, just like everybody else, it seems. Yep. Um, and the, I found that super frustrating to begin with because on the default setting, it does so much. So I actually ended up emailing Rune, the developer, and he sent me back a patch with, well, not a patch, a preset with uh, everything dialed down to minimum. So it's like, whenever you put that plug in the chain, it's going to do something to the processing because that's what the, the analog box does and it's emulating the analog box. So that's the whole point. But I was just like, there's too many variables, right? I need something that introduces minimal tonal coloration, minimal valve saturation, all the rest of it. And then I can play with each of the parameters and go, okay, that's what that does. And, and that's how I find an understanding of each of those. And then it's like, okay, now I can throw it in. And because I understand it, I, I'm happy to make the changes yeah. that I'm changing, right? But you, I needed that kind of minimal baseline position to, to figure it out. Um, but the nice thing is once you've done the work, once you've got your head around the technical stuff, then you can just forget about it and just focus yep. on the music, right? Because you don't want to, I don't want to be thinking about you know, I don't know, ratios or thresholds in the middle of, you know, it's just yeah. like, is this, is it right? Does this feel right? You know, am I, does it make me want to dance? Is, am I nodding mm. my head? You know, is the emotion coming through all that stuff? Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a really fun balancing act. And I mean, I enjoy the challenge of getting stuff to the loudness that I enjoy. 
it's just, I think for everybody, there's a point where taste comes into it and you kind of feel like, Ugh, you know, I, I, I can't be bothered to spend hours figuring this out because I don't think it's what works musically, you know? Um, and, and that's, that's why I, you know, had this polite conversation with my clients about what their goals are and whether I'm the right person to work on. And I think maybe one little thing to add about that is the nice thing about that conversation is even in the situations where the clients go, you know what, we do want this to be super loud. So we are going to go quite often. They will come back in future and say, no, we've got a different project where we want something different. You'd be the perfect person to work on it. Or they speak to somebody else and like, you know what, who'd who'd be great for your thing is Ian. He would absolutely love working on this for you. So, you know, I feel like, it's it's a win win, right? Everybody um, gets to to work on the stuff that they they enjoy, and everybody gets a result that they're happy with. Yeah, and I think that's that's really important. Is and actually, funnily enough, I was speaking with my wife about having this call yesterday, and I'll, I'll circle back this because you said something really important there, which is having a respectful conversation with your clients, and you get a lot of respect back from that. If, if anybody's an audio professional listening, uh, one of the worst things. And it kills my heart, and I'm sure it would kill yours as well, is when you hear about engineers, like you said, at bigger name studios or whatnot, when when they when people feel like they can't talk to them or they've told their clients that no, that's the way. Like that really hurts. Like for me as a professional, I know for you as a professional, that really hurt. Um and I told my wife about, you know, I'm having a call with this mastering engineer and he's really into dynamics. I'm sort of like more on the loudness side. And um I know that, you know, some people who follow his channel have commented on mine saying, you know, negative 14, negative four, which isn't a resemblance of you, but it's just a sent, a, a, an audience sentiment. And I know on your channel, you'd have the opposite of people going, yep, yeah, that's not the way it is. You know, in the industry, you know, you gotta, you gotta make it louder. And she, she said something really interesting. She goes, um, you know, is this guy a respectful guy? You know, is, is he a nice, you know, like, you know, some people online can be a bit brash and I go, no, 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 no. I've, I've, I've heard him speak and, you know, I'm listening to his podcast, you know, he's, he's, he's really tame, really good. And he goes, that, that's really good because she goes, if your audiences, if, if there, if there's a subset of your audiences that are, that are very combative in conversation, it'd be very healthy for them to see two people, a different uh, other sides of the aisle discussing things in an amicable way. And I thought, you know, that that's a really good point because, and like you said, there's space for everybody to coexist. And I think that's, that's really healthy. And, and, uh, you know, if I can take two exceptionally valuable things from the conversation we're having is number one, uh, the first thing is musicality trumps most of the discussion we're having here, like 99.9% of the discussion. And secondly, is that there's there's not one way to go about anything, and also it's not about being right or wrong about it. It's about working to what the sensibilities are of of what's there and being respectful, especially especially what you touched on there, your clients. Yeah, no, I, I love that. I I completely agree, and it's it's why when you asked me whether I'd be interested in having this conversation, that I was I basically thought, yeah, absolutely, because I do think the risk of I don't want this i feel like it's becoming a very another another very binary issue you know it's kind of you must have loudness or loudness is bad right and neither of those is my perspective it's much more nuanced than that you know it's much more interesting than that you know it's there is stuff where loudness works um and is artistically necessary and all the rest of it and there is stuff where that that's not the case and it, it is it's all about having respectful conversations so yes i get misinterpreted because i talk so much about the why i think normalization streaming normalization is important and minus 14 happens to be the number and i think in combination with the fact that spotify say on their website oh you should aim for minus 14 Mm -hmm. which i disagree with and i wish they would remove it um people kind of catch the, they hear bits of the conversation and they think, oh, Ian says you must have minus 14. You know, that's not true, right? I I mean, having said that, I've got a bunch of stuff that ends up being minus 14. Sounds fantastic. I'm really pleased with it. It's not like I think minus 14 doesn't work. It's just that there is no number to aim at, right? There's no, I mean, this is the thing. I, people get upset about the name of the, the website loudness penalty, right? Which we chose, um, we deliberately chose it to be prov- provocative. We thought about something a bit more dull and we were just like, no, this is, this is fun. This will get the conversation happening. This is, and it was originally a free, it was never intended to be a plugin or anything else. It was just a free website to help people. Cause they were like, 
how loud is my stuff going to be? What's going to happen? How much is it going to be turned down? So that was the idea of the website was to help them. So we picked this name and we had no idea that it would kind of explode in the way that it has to, you know, people use it in conversation when they're not even talking about the website. And that upsets a lot of people because the penalty is not the number, right? If there's a penalty, it's because your music doesn't sound the way that you hoped when that number is applied. Because whatever it is, whatever the statistics, 80% of the time, when pe most people listen online, 80% of the time, I mean, YouTube is 80% of the audience, right? So, and you can't turn it off there. So the loudest stuff is going to get turned down. So it's, it's a fact of life that however loud you make the master, it's going to get heard probably at minus 14. So then the question is, how does it sound? And if it sounds fantastic, there's no penalty. Even if your song was turned down by six or eight or nine dBs, whatever. If it sounds the way you hope and it sounds amazing to you, it's you're good to go. Um, if it doesn't, that's really important information to have because then you've got the opportunity to, to make adjustments to figure out why. You know, and when, as you know, when things are loudness matched, you can suddenly go, you notice, oh, the, the bass isn't quite kicking in the way that I expected it to. Or I'm noticing that distortion in the in the high frequencies more than I was when there was this big loudness difference between the two, right? That's why it's important as a tool when we're mastering. But also it's become important for how people hear music. So it gives you the opportunity to, to make those changes if you want. It means you're listening in the way that the audience are listening, you know, whatever it is, 80% of people are hearing it that way. Um, but yeah, the numbers don't matter. It's like, if you're happy with the result, you're good to go. Um, it's, uh, but it's a super important part of the, the process to figure this stuff out. And yeah, I'm hoping that, you know, by having this kind of conversation, um, people start to realize it's not as simple as saying, oh, you should aim for this number. You know, there's, there is, it's, there's a lot more to think about and musicality is the most important thing. Um, and yeah, if we can just, if everybody can just kind of dial it back a bit, <laughs> no pun intended. Well, it wasn't a pun intended, but I ended up with one. Um, you know, we, yeah, people can get to the point where they feel comfortable to do what they feel is right for their music. Um, and that might be super loud or it might be more dynamic, um, might be super dynamic, you know, um, um, it's all good. Um, hopefully that's, that's, you know, that's what I would like to happen. That's what I'm optimistic about. I mean, looking back, you kind of think it's been 10 years of normalization. Now things haven't really improved in the sense that people still, I still see every day people saying, you've got to make it super loud and it'll still sound better. Um, so who knows what's going to happen, but yeah. hopefully if we can have, and that's what I like about your channel is that you're digging into the details, you know, being honest about the stuff that you're finding out um, and sharing it with everybody. And I think the more we can, um, have those kind of conversations in mastering rather than how to get super loud, <laughs> you know, three minute tip. Yeah. Here's my perfect mastering chain. You know, that, that kind of stuff isn't going to help anybody. Um, the whole thing about master, the, the whole, for me, profession of mastering, you know, is love of music. Um, a, a help, big dose of control freakery. Um, and, um, a real balance of technical and musical understanding. So you make the two to work together, you know? Um, so I, that's the kind of, that's the message I'd like to get. Uh, that's what I try and kind of share on the podcast and the, and the YouTube channel and stuff. Um, and yeah, the more conversations like that we can have, the better, I think. Yeah. I, th I think keying in on the conversations is really good. Um, cause even when people are polarized, maybe it's not, it's, it's less about dialing it down. It's more about dialing up the questions you ask somebody to understand where they're coming from and learn. Because I'll say this, I am, uh, how do I put it? I'm a culprit, not a culprit. I think it shows my maturity and where I am because what happens is uh, if you've watched for a period of time on my channel, um, I do, I reflect what's happening at the studio, what's going on in terms of my inner workings. And a lot of the time, not a lot, some of the time I'm like, yep, this just has to be bloody louder because contextually for that particular project or for what's going on, that's what's in my head. Um, and I can be myopic. I can be pretty myopic when it comes to things like that in terms of like that, that's it. I, I think I, I will uh, leave you with a compliment to say um, that I respect your maturity in the way you approach the discussion. And that's sort of like what got me into the emailing you because I listened to the podcast episodes, uh, the tour that I sent you, um, uh, the one on 
peak peak levels um, into sample into sample peaks, which I'd done things on previously. So I was really curious to hear your take on it. And uh, another one with um, was it Shahan from Isotope or a different um, uh, Alexi? Uh, Alexi, yes, yes, yeah, Alexi, yeah. Um, who I've spoken with as well before, and I'm like, okay, I don't disagree with anything you're saying. Which was like, okay, I don't disagree with anything you're saying, so I need to 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 force myself to be a little bit more open, and 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 give you the floor um, to go back and forth with because and and as and as we've had this conversation, I've, I've as I said, as a compliment, I've I've been um, very impressed by your your maturity in terms of the way you approach things. I think you know i'm not trying to say you're, you're going into pension at all but it it it, it it's Thank telling you. of your age and experience um just a bit of tongue-in-cheek there but uh yeah no 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 i just i i genuinely appreciate it because i know people get who who get passionate about things can leave discussions around the perimeter of what they're focused on out of the conversation right? and i think you healthily have you know, being good at conversing in this. I mean, thank you. I appreciate that. I do think it's something I've got better at. Um, I don't think necessarily think it's to do with age, but I do think maybe it's experience. I think, you know, the reality is back in the 15 years ago, I started this online event called Dynamic Range Day. Um, and with yep. hindsight, my messaging was not the best, right? It, you know, I was talking a lot about good and bad and saying that I thought that loudness was pointless and all, all kinds of stuff that now with hindsight, I think, ah, you know, there would have been better ways to, to, to express that stuff, you know? Um, so yeah, I, I don't think I can kind of claim any, um, uh, take much credit. It's, it's, it's more like kind of, okay, well I did that wrong. So I need, to, I need to do better. Um, and I want to say in return, kudos to you for, you know, for, for reaching out and having, a conversation like this. I mean, this is my experience whenever I talk to to pros, right? Because I have a lot of conversations all the time with with colleagues, other you know, people in the in the profession. And at the end of the day, we all basically agree. You know, everybody has their own kind of threshold of okay, well, I'm this is where it's too loud, or it has to be this. You know, everybody's opinion about where the sweet spot is varies, um, but we all understand the you know the physics behind it and the the everybody wants the music to sound great and to have happy clients you know and it's mm. that's that's the balance and, and everybody finds their own way so yeah it's you know there's there's so many different ways to what's the expression oh uh, skin a cat people don't like it when i talk about yeah. skin of cats but <laughs> but you know it's, there are so many different yes give give five different mastering engineers the same thing to master left to their own devices in my experience You'll get amazing consistency between the results, but fascinating subtleties in the differences and really fascinating differences in the way that they achieve them. You know, um, even down to I just the one that springs to mind for me is is crossfades on live albums. Um, back when I worked at SRT, mm. you know, it's a really fun challenge to take, especially over a wide period of time. You've got a live album, the, the client wants a seamless perfor uh, performance kind of experience but they're from 10 different gigs from three different tours you know so you're using audience loops you're fading in and out trying to get it to feel convincing as it flows through and you get to a point you think yeah it's really good and you're going to get somebody else's opinion and they come in and they say oh yeah that's good but what about this and they do all this other stuff and you end up with something and i listen to it at the end and i go well that's also good but i don't think it's any better than mine you just did it differently you know it's yeah and i think the same thing's true with all this stuff you know do you use compression, do you use limiting, do you use clipping, do you use saturation, do you use parallel compression, all this, you know, at the end of the day, 90% of the job is, is level EQ compression and limiting. Um, and all the other stuff is just icing on the cake. So, um, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's really nice to talk about it. It's fun to have conversations with, um, people about this stuff and it's fun to have it knowing that this is going to go out on YouTube because it's the kind of conversation that, like I say, happens all the time on the phone, you know, on Zoom, when you meet people for beers, whatever. Um, and maybe the kind of conversation that doesn't actually get enough exposure, if you like, in the in the online community. So, you know, hopefully people get something out of it. Yeah, me too. Well, thank thank you kindly. Thank you kindly for having the chat with me, man. Thank you. My pleasure. I enjoyed it.